morning, and uh, we're going to kind of survey this sixth chapter of the book of Amos. Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6. Let's look at verse 1. Woe to you who at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, noble persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is your territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put off the day of the doom, who cause the great seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who chant to the sound of stringed instruments and event for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now go captives as the first of the captives, and those who, who recline at banquets shall be removed. The Lord has sworn it by himself. The Lord of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob. I hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Then it shall come to pass that if ten remain in the house, they shall die. And when a kinsman of the dead with one who will burn the bodies picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to the one inside the house, are there any more with you? Then someone will say, none. And he will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord gives a commandment. He will break the great house into bits and the little houses into pieces. Do horses run on rocks? Does, you plow, do you, does one plow with an oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice over Lodibar, who say, we have, have we not taken uh, Karnam for ourselves by our own strength? But hold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts. And they will flick you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of Arabah. May the Lord's rich bless, blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Thank, Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you might open it to us now, that we might see your glory, your majesty, and your splendor. And even the harsh words to Israel, that we might still see your grace that you was offering to them, your unmerited favor, if they will but repent and put their faith and their trust in you. Speak a good word to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're going to continue our thoughts this morning from this Old Testament book of Amos. And Amos is referred to as one of the minor prophets, not because his work was not important, but because his writing is not as long as the writings of, say, a Jeremiah or an Isaiah or even a Daniel. And whereas the minor prophets like Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Micah and Habakkuk, uh, they had prolific preaching ministries. And they did not write as much as some of the major prophets, but they were the seers. And that is a term that, re that was used to refer to the prophet, the one who sees, the seer, the seer. And the prophets would get a vision from God, and they would bring that message to the people. And as you've, we saw in recent weeks, I mean, Amos was a no-nonsense prophet. Uh, he had been basically a herdsman, a shepherd. He had also grown and tended to sycamore fig trees, but God called him from that occupation, and he called him to be a prophet. And even though he was born in the southern uh, uh, province of Judah, uh, the Lord called him to go to the north and to prophesy to the northern kingdom. And his prophecy was so antagonistic, it was so scathing, he brought a real harsh rebuke against the northern kingdom, so much so uh, that they, they ran him out of Samaria. And he had to flee back to Judah, and that's when he writes his words. So this morning, we're going to see this big theme, this big idea from Amos chapter 6. And the big idea is simply this, is that material blessings does not mean that we are 
that God is pleased with us. The material blessing does not mean that God is pleased with us. And in this 21st century era, the Christian church, this name it and claim it, this get it and grab it, we've equated material prosperity to the blessings of God. It's not necessarily so. Uh, someone can be blessed materially and be blessed with the Lord. Someone can be blessed materially and not really have the blessings of the Lord upon their lives. And Amos points that out to the northern king of Israel, that they thought they were blessed because they had these plush palaces. They thought they were blessed because they had these voluptuous homes and they ate, ate the finest food, those who were part of the political, the social, and the spiritual elite. But they did not have the blessings of God. As a matter of fact, their plush lifestyles was being used by God through the prophet Amos to bring an indictment against them because of how they had acquired the material prosperity and how they were using it and their indifference and their apathy toward those who were less fortunate than they. But let's just back up for a second to Amos chapter 5 because these two chapters have to be really study in the context because they're complementary uh, one to another. We laid out last week just a simple outline because these two chapters are not easy to outline because he's weaving back and forth to the proclamation of the coming judgment, which is the big theme of chapter 5, that judgment is going to come, the proclamation of the coming judgment. And then he talks about the prescription for the judgment. Why is God going to judge them? God is not going to judge them in a vacuum. God is not going to judge them just because God is a a capricious killjoy, and God just liked to spank and beat up on people. No, there was a specific prescription that Amos lays out as to why they were going to be judged. And number one, because of their idolatry. They had turned from the worship of the true and the living God. They were worshiping idols. They were going to worship God, and then they would go and worship the idols. And they would worship the idols because the idols did not bring any restrictions upon their lifestyle so they could do what they wanted to do and have a clear conscience saying, well, we've worshipped. Well, they've worshipped false idols. And they were not allowing God to inform their conscience as about how they should live. It's because of idolatry. And as we said before, there are a couple of companions of idolatry. There's a couple of things that will follow idolatry. Once people stop worshipping the true and the living God, a couple of things will normally happen. One is they will, be, they will drift into indulgence, to indulgences of sin. It can be sexual morality, which is often associated with pagan idolatry because the sexual drive is such a powerful drive that human beings have given by God for procreation, for passion, for bonding of men and women in the context of marriage. But when it is not regulated by the prescription of the word of God and by the Holy Spirit, it can drive people into the most gross behavior. You see that in pagan religions very often. In pagan religions, you will find that they create a way for people to participate and practice in gross sexual morality and debauchery, and they tell them it's bringing you closer to God. You'll see that. Secondly, you will often see the abuse of substances. This is not something that is new. If you look at the old religions, the, the occultic religions, you'll find out they've been smoking stuff, drinking stuff, and sniffing stuff as long as there have been people on the planet. Substance abuse is not something new to the United States of America. It's not something new to the modern era. It was a part of the occultic uh, religions of old. Every society, every society known to man has sought out and has found intoxicants, recreational intoxicants. Every society has done that. We have just placed recreational intoxicants on steroids in the modern era. Because of our advances in science and in chemistry, we always can strip these modulating chemicals from a particular substance to make it more powerful, to make it more potent, so that people can have an even more exhilarating high. If you have some time to kind of move away from your regular TV watching and watch National Geographic Channel, Channel 74, if you have the basic cable. They have a whole TV show every week, and they talk about drugs incorporated. And uh, they've given the history of the drugs. They've looked at the different drugs that have come on the scene and how each generation of people in America have found a drug that they would follow after and that would take them deeper into some type of uh, alternate state of mind. Uh, 
Uh, it, it's as old as the country itself. It's starting out with tobacco and caffeine and then graduating to cocaine and marijuana and heroin, which was created. Most people don't realize that heroin does not appear naturally. Heroin is derived from the opiates. From a, it's an opium-based drug, but heroin was created by the Bayer Corporation, the same Bayer Corporation that manufactures Bayer aspirins. They introduced heroin as a pain-killing medication and, and substitute for morphine because morphine is highly addictive and many people became morphine addicts while they were being prescribed medication by physicians. So the Bayer Corporations went into their laboratories and they would come up with another drug and they developed heroin. And they introduced heroin in the early 1900s. And by 1915, we had a major heroin epidemic in this country. And it was facilitated by the Bayer Corporation. You could buy heroin in the drugstore. You could order in the series of a robot catalog. You could order the needle and the heroin because none of those drugs are illegal. What they did not know, they did not know once heroin is taken into the body through uh, the hypodermic needle, it goes immediately to the central nervous system. It then ends up in the liver, and in the liver, heroin metastasizes, it metabolizes, and it becomes morphine. And that's why heroin is so much more addictive than morphine. And so with every society, and so now you come into the modern era when cocaine comes back on the scene and people realize there's nothing new about cocaine. Cocaine was in, in the scene in the early 19, actually the mid 1800s, became a major epidemic in the 1900s. Went underground and became illegal. Comes back in the 60s and 70s. That's some new drugs, the champagne of drugs. The drug of the jet setters, the trendsetters. The bankers, the lawyers, the upscale business people. That was their drug because it was so expensive. The South American drug cartel, the Cali and the Medellin cartels, created a multi-million dollar operation to bring cocaine into this country to satisfy the appetites of that population. And then they decided we need a McDonald's version of cocaine. And the Cali drug cartel developed crack to introduce it in the inner cities to the poor people so the poor people could have access to cocaine that they could afford. And so then cocaine becomes the epidemic craze of the 80s and the 90s. And then in the 90s, we're introduced to methamphetamines. But methamphetamines, nothing new. Methamphetamines were developed by the Germans because they normally had the best chemists in the world. And the Germans developed the methamphetamines. Hitler himself was on methamphetamine. He took five shots a day. The German troops were on methamphetamine. That's how they could travel and march so many miles. And they were such a powerful army because they were hyped up on methamphetamines. The Japanese began to take methamphetamines, their kamikaze, this is nothing new. Every society has chased after some mind-altering drug that becomes a recreational intoxicant that becomes the demise of the society itself. So now here's where we are. So now we have all these drugs at the same time in our communities, in our society. But not only do we have all of these drugs, like the marijuana, the cocaine, the heroin, the methamphetamines, and then we have a whole laundry list of prescription drugs that's more powerful than any of those drugs. And they're more deadly. So more people die in this country from prescription drugs than all illegal drugs combined. That's what they don't tell you. Because the pharmaceutical industry is pumping so much money into advertising drugs directly to the consumer. So this whole idea of being an altered state of mind is nothing new. It was first introduced thousands of years ago in religious groups, in the part of their religious practices, to where they were communed more deeply with the gods. And so you see a pattern that often follows. When people stop worshiping the true and the living God, when people stop calling on God, when people stop being energized by the power of God, when people are not held hostage by their faith in the living God, life becomes hard, the pressure becomes unbearable, and the mind just can't take it. And so people look for things to alter their state of mind to be able to cope with the pressures of society. And that's where we are. People trying to prep to... to to function and to handle the ambiguity, the uncertainty, the vicissitudes of life. And nothing is constant but change. And all the pressures that many people don't have a God to call on. And they don't have a church family to lean on and people to pray with and encourage them and a faith to remind them of God's great faithfulness in the past and people in the Bible and members of their families. And that's why we need to create as many forms and venues as we can. Uh, for Sister Janet Lawson to give her testimony, gives us a powerful 
testimony of faith in God and the power of faith of an individual and her family to sustain her through a horrific experience because we're going to need to call on that testimony because all of us are going to face some unbearable situation. And we're going to need the testimony of everybody we know to prop us up and remind us that somebody else has gone through something. And the same God that they serve is the God that I serve, and the God that helped them can also help me. That's what's wrong with young people today. See, they're not close enough to the church. And so this group of generational young people, they don't have a historical memory of the Bible stories and about the faith of God. And they haven't been around the people praying and testifying about how good God is, how faithful God is, how powerful God is. And so now many young people, they just can't deal with any type of pressure. They can't deal with any type of pressure, so they encounter pressure in life, and someone is going to offer them a pill or a cigarette or some way to handle it without them just having to face it and deal with the hurt, the pain, the disappointment, or whatever it may be. And that's why it's so important for the church to reach out to these young people, try to connect them to the church, pray for them, pray over them, let them hear our stories of the great things that God has done for us, because they're going to go through something down here. They're going to go through something down here. You don't get through this life without some pain, some scars, some hurts, being betrayed, being disappointed, without having your heart broken. It just doesn't happen down here without you experience those type of situations. So it's our faith in God, our confidence in him, and the fact that we have a record of other people who have lived faithfully to him and didn't give up, didn't give in, and didn't cave in to pressure that serves as a ballast to stabilize us. Can I get some help? And there's about 1217 now, y'all better help me. Well, it's officially 1212. They try to trick me, Brother Chuck Overstreet. They put that clock back there on the wall and they got it about 12 minutes fast to try to hurry me up. But I got the real legitimate Eastern Standard Time clock right here, so I know what time it is. It's 1212. And so Israel had drifted away from God. The apple of his eye, his prized possession, those who had experienced all of the benefits and the blessing of being the people of God in their own land. The borders had been expanded. The land flowing with milk and honey. They got the best fruit, the best vegetables, the best water supply, the best of everything you could possibly have. And they had the best God, the only God, the only true and the living God. But they wanted a God like the other nations. Because the God that they had said, you can't do this and you can't do that. And you can't have another man's wife and you can't have another man's husband and you can't have another man's ox and you can't have another man's cow. You got to work and get your own. They didn't like that. So the other nations, you could do whatever you want to. Have your two and three and four wives if you wanted it. And they looked at the other nations and said, we want a God like that. So they went a-whoring after the other gods. And they brought the other gods in. And they let the other gods coexist with the true and the living God. And so God now brings his indictment against them. You are being going to be judged because of your idolatry. And secondly, what idolatry does when we depart from God, not only we often drift in immorality, we drift in uh, substance abuse and indulgences, but we also can drift where we don't see other people as being equal to us. We lose the value of the individual. We don't see everybody else having the same value and the same worth that we have. We don't see them as being created in the image of God and tied to the same type of protections that we have. Are you following me? So what do they do? They start oppressing their brothers and their sisters. They created a political, economic, social, and spiritual system that allowed them to ex exploit the working poor. So the working poor was doing all the hard work and all the hard labor, but they had an inverted system of economics where the economics was going up to the top, to the elite that controlled the system. Sound like anything that you know? And so God calls for national repentance and a prediction of their destruction. So just quickly summarize in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 5, basically he proclaims the judgment is coming. The virgin Israel, the nation that had never been conquered by another nation, is getting ready to be conquered. She's going to fall. She's going to be forsaken. And nobody's going to be able to help her, says the Lord, verse 3. She's going to be dwindled down to a fraction of the people that she did have in her country because many are going to be taken captive. 
Her only hope, verse 4, is for to repent and seek me. Not the gods at Bethel, not the gods at Gilgal, not the gods at Beersheba, not the gods at Gilgal, but seek me, the true and the living God. I'm the only one that can help. If you don't seek me, he says, then a fire is going to break out in your house. And in the Bible, fire is always used to denote judgment. Fire breaks out in your house, and you're going to be judged. And no one will be able to quench it. Verse 7, you turn justice into corruption. Wormwood, verse 7. And you've laid aside righteousness, this idea of trying to live by the grace of God, a holy and a righteous life. You said that doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter how people live. He says, you better turn to me and you better call on me, verses 8 through 9, the God who created the heavens, the seas, the waters. He's the only one that can help you. And then he delineates the things that he hates. And we spent a considerable time last week on this. Verse 10, he says, I hate those who rebuke the judges who stand in the gate who are trying to speak the truth. He says, I hate those who try to silence the truth tellers. Verse 11, therefore you've tread the ground, the poor. You've grinded the poor into the ground. You've taken away the grain as taxes. So you can live in houses made out of stone. You can plant pleasant vineyards and drink voluptuous wine from them. He says, but I'm coming in judgment. Your religious system, your political system, your economic system is corrupt with those who are taking bribes, verse 12. And then he appeals to them in verse 13, seek good, not evil, that you may live. So the Lord of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Verse 16, he says the, the day of judgment is going to come and it's going to be a calamity for you who think it's only going to be for your enemies. And he says, there'll be nowhere for you to escape. And Amos gives the, the illustration. He says, you're going to be like a man who's running from a lion. And just when he's escaped the lion and he catches his breath, he falls into the hands of a bear. He escaped the paws of the bear by his own tenacity and its own dexterity, he slips out of the bear's arms and runs into his house and shuts the door and leans up against the wall and says, wow, that was a close call. And he's bitten by a serpent. Amos says, you can't escape. You escape the lion, the bear will get you. If you escape the bear, the serpent is going to get you. There's nowhere you can hide to escape the judgment of God. And then he brings a scathing indictment against him in verse 21. He says, I hate everything about you doing. I hate your feast days. I hate your holidays. I hate all of those ceremonial things that you're doing. I hate your meat offerings. I hate your grain offerings. He says, I hate it. I hate your music, verse 21. All the noise that you're making. But he says, if you want to get my attention, then you better let justice roll down like mighty waters. And righteousness like a mighty stream. And so he's laying out to them their prescription as to what God expects. And a few thoughts in chapter 7, and we'll be through. I mean, chapter 6. So open up chapter 6, and he says, Woe unto you in Zion, who at ease. You think things are well. The economy is well. Unemployment is down. Employment is up. Good returns on your investment. Your houses, your mortgages, your, your real estates, it's all appreciating in value. He says, war unto you, noble person, the chief of the nations in Samaria. He says, go down to other cities, he delineates, Calne, Hamath, Gath, and go to those cities. Are you greater than those cities? And the answer was no. They, they weren't any greater than those cities. He says, so what make you think that you're so special part for my blessing and my protection. Verse 4. Woe. See, woe is, we don't understand woe. <laughs> woe is the pronouncement of judgment. Remember Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up, 
his train did indeed fill the temple. And when Isaiah saw this transcendent view of God, what did he say? Woe is me. Isaiah, this righteous prophet, this quintessence of spirituality, when he saw how holy God really was, how magnificent and grand God really was, and when he saw himself in comparison, Isaiah pronounced judgment upon himself. He says, woe is me. He says, I'm, 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 I'm undone. I'm disintegrating. I'm coming apart. I'm morally bankrupt. I have no rights to stand in the presence of God. He said, the people I live with are corrupt. Isaiah, the prophet of God, he says, my lips are corrupt. The very lips that are pronounced judgment on other people are now pronouncing judgment upon me because my lips are corrupt. He says, my eyes have seen the glory of God. So he says, whoa, he's pronouncing judgment upon them. Whoa, he says. Then look at what else he says in verse 6. He says, woe to you, verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 3 of uh, Amos 6. Woe to you who put off the day of the doom, who who cause seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on couches, eat lamb from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who chant to the sound of string instruments and invent yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls. I mean, they were partying so big, they didn't drink a dram out of a cup. They had a bowl. <laughs> they had a big bowl to drink their wine out of because every day was a perpetual party. Every day was a time of a great cabaret. They anointed themselves. They had all the spices and all the oils. None of this stuff is new. They anointed themselves and they had their massage. They were getting themselves ready for their extracurricular activities. I'll just put it like that and be very discreet. Y'all know what, what was I going to say? <laughs> what was I thinking about? Y'all got it. But look at verse 6b. He says, but you're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. You see, one of the things that is supposed to be a distinguishing feature of the people of God is that the people of God is also always to feel the pain of the most broken people in the society. Because the most broken people in the society are the people that need to experience the healing power of God the most. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't enjoy the works of our hands. Absolutely not. We should enjoy the works of our labor. We should enjoy that we can have a decent place to live, decent clothes to wear, you know, live in a safe, healthy environment and neighborhood. We should enjoy that. But while we are enjoying that and every time we bow down to eat a great big T-bone steak that is filled with fat and cholesterol and all that stuff that we don't need a whole lot of, we should be reminded, Lord, there are other people less fortunate than me. So what had happened to them is they had lost this consciousness that God had created them to be this light, this testimony to give hope to the broken. And they were to feel the pain of the broken, particularly their own brothers and their sisters, because they were all the descendants of slaves that was down in Egypt. So anybody who had made it to upper class, middle class, elite class, they were only there because of the grace of God, not merely of their own effort and their own work. And so he excoriates them. He lambasts them for losing sight of the fact that they are to feel the pain are the most marginalized in the society and try to respond in a way that will be pleasing and acceptable to God. He says, so you're not, you're not, you don't feel the pain. You're not grieving over the pain of Joseph. And in their case, they were actually benefiting from the work, the hard work, the hard labor that the poor people were exerting during that time, the agrarian economy, the livestock, the planting, the harvesting, that was hard work. And those who owned the land were reaping all the benefit. And so God, he calls them out on that. He calls them out on it. And we'll wrap it up right here. He ends, ends it in, in the, the, those remaining verses that which we read in your hearing, it, it was about the, the judgment and how severe that the judgment is going to be. 
And in verse 14, he says, Behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Haman to the valley of Arava. Now what we're going to see in future chapters is that he continues to appeal to them that there was still time and a space for them to repent. There was still a time and a space for them to seek God and turn back to God and become God's instrument of righteousness, of justice, of mercy, and of compassion to their nation, to those who needed to see that revelatory power of God. And so as we look at where the church in this nation is, in the United States of America, the wealthiest it's ever been in terms of the property that it owns, the, the money, the resources that it has, uh, as wealthy as the church has ever been uh, in this country. And it also has political connections like it's never had before because many churches have been courted by the politicians and they've, some have aligned with certain political parties and persuasions and they greatly influence uh, particular, and it's on both sides, Democrat and Republican. But what is troubling is that when you look at what the church is talking about, there's only three things that the church will say much about. I'm talking about the big churches, the national churches, the evangelical churches, the fundamental churches, three things. We talk about prayer in school and how bad it is they took prayer out of school. We talk about that. We talk about the fact that we are against abortion on demand. We talk about that. And we talk about same-sex marriages. Those are three things that we just beat to death. We talk about it, we beat them to death in terms of what our position is and where we are on those three issues. But seldom do we talk about other injustices that exist in our society that is oppressing whole groups of people. We seldom talk about the injustice with the children in the child foster care system. And West Virginia has the worst, one of the worst in the United States of America one of the highest rates of child abuse and neglect in the United States of America is in almost heaven, West Virginia. And the church seldom makes that case in a way that would get the attention of policymakers and force some type of action to be taken. We seldom make the case about what's happening with people who are institutionalized in mental health hospitals. You ever visit one lately? They're overcrowded, they're understaffed, they're under-resourced one of the most marginal groups in the society, but you seldom hear the church talking about there has to be a response that is compassionate and that is right about that, about that group and about that population of people. And so very often groups, whole groups of people that can be marginalized, criminalized, the church seldom is a clarion voice saying, but that's not right. It's not fair. And it is not just. That is what gives us power. We don't have power because we go along with the status quo. We have power because we stand up to the status and challenge the quo. We have power because we're trying to speak the truth of God in such a way that will arrest people's attention where they realize what they're doing is wrong and they need to change. We have power when we're willing to be the instrument of God, the voice. God's mouthpiece, if necessary, God's special prosecutor to bring charges against whether it's political, social, economic, or even religious institutions that allow groups to be oppressed, allow groups to be continue to live on a burden of pain and agony only because no one would do anything about it to change. I'm going to close. And this could be on my appetite. If this nation doesn't change, the instrument that I believe that God is going to use to judge us, it might not be another country. It might be the very kids that we're raising. 
or not raising? Or not raising? The very children that we are ignoring and not paying attention to. And they are arming themselves literally with weapons like no other generation in this country now. Over in Saudi Arabia and those Islamic countries, they start arming them kids when they're six and seven, right? Because they're going to fight the holy war, the holy jihad against us. So they're being trained to be warriors. But these kids are being armed in the neighborhood and in the streets. And they got a growing resentment against authority. They got a growing resentment against the political economic system. And they, a growing resentment that some of them have even toward the church. And I believe it may be our ultimate downfall is that we let too many kids get away. Too many kids get away that never got nurtured. No one grabbed hold to them when they were little bitty people and said, you count, you have value, you have worth. I love you, I'm concerned about you. I'm gonna help you learn how to read and how to add and subtract and how to write. I'm not going to let you be a throwaway. I'm not going to let you be a throwaway. You know, every war that we got to fight, we eventually got to fight them with our children of the day. If we're going to fight Al-Qaeda, we're going to have to produce a group of soldiers that can fight Al-Qaeda and that can, can actually manage and operate the sophisticated equipment that we are developed to fight these wars. It's always our own self-interest trying to protect and help our children. And that, I believe, may be one of the most scathing indictments that would be brought against this country. And you can look everywhere, the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, you know, human trafficking, the number of young boys and girls, girls and boys, I should say, that is trapped in this human trafficking thing. It is beyond belief. And these are issues that we seldom even talk about. And they're real, and they're getting closer and closer to us all the time. West Virginia will not be exempt or immune from these issues. So what do we want to be? We just want to be the church. The church that loves God, the church that loves the word of God, the church that loves people, and the church that's for people. That's for people coming to know Christ, for people being encouraged in the scripture. That's for people being treated with dignity and respect. It's for people being shown respect and kindness and mercy to be for people. And if we be for people, I believe that God can use us to reach out to a group that certainly needs to hear that message. Amen? 1232, I'm sorry. Oh, you seven minutes. I'm out of my time. I thank you for yours. Father, we thank you for